in the region of Arabia, the number of believers of Prophet Abraham decreased considerably and people began to worship stages and idols they had built. After the elephant incident, the value of Kaaba increased a lot in the eyes of people and Mecca became a destination for a great number of people for pilgrimage from nearby areas. The Meccans made their living through trade. Thanks to the pagans coming and going in Mecca, some Meccan merchants added richness to their wealth. Read with the name of your Lord, who created, he created man from a clod. Read and your Lord is the most generous, the one who taught to write with a pen, the one who taught man all what he did not know. It had been three years since the last of the prophets, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, was given the duty of prophecy. After three years of secret invitation, Allah said, Tell clearly what you are commanded to do. Turn away from the polytheists. We are enough for you against those who ridicule. Upon those verses, the invitation to Islam began to be made openly. However, this invitation was never in the interest of the polytheists of Mecca, especially the rich ones, because the Prophet was calling on people to turn away from the idols they had worshipped and to believe in Allahu Azimushan, the one God, and to accept the existence and unity of Allah. If this invitation was accepted and the idols in Mecca were destroyed, the pagans in the Arabian region would not come to Mecca and the income of the Meccan merchants would decrease, perhaps their wealth would end. In addition, the Quraysh were one of the most respected tribes in all the lands of Arabia. They worried that if they renounced the pagan beliefs of their ancestors, their reputations would be damaged throughout Arabia. Moreover, they did not want to abandon the religions of their ancestors, who had worshipped idols for centuries. For these and many other reasons, the polytheists of Mecca were trying to prevent the spread of Islam and were committing many atrocities against those who were Muslims. No one was shopping with the Muslims. The polytheists began to seize the powerless Muslims one by one, torture and murder them. Thereupon, the Prophet ordered the weak from the Muslims to migrate to Abyssinia because of the wishes torches of Quraysh and to stay there until the salvation from nuisance that Muslims suffered. The persecution of Muslims had reached the level of savagery. It was impossible for Muslims to stay in Mecca because of those unbearable tortures. They presented the situation to the Prophet and asked for permission to migrate. So the Messenger of Almighty, peace be upon him, pointed out the ways to Medina and said, From now on, your new destination for migration, a city which is a field of days between two stony places has shown me and Allah Ta'ala has blessed you with a land where you will find brothers and sisters and peace. After that, the Muslims prepared without making the polytheists feel it and they began to migrate secretly one by one, helping each other.
Thus, Medina became a shelter and refuge for Muslims. Meccan polytheists' fears came true. Islam had spread beyond Mecca and gained great prestige among the people of Medina. The Muslims of Medina welcomed their Muslim brothers and sisters from Mecca with embracing them and helped them wholeheartedly. For this reason, the Muslims of Mecca were called Muhajir and the Muslims of Medina were called Ansar in the sense of those who helped. And Medina became a headquarters of the Muslims who made preparations to make the religion of Allah dominant one day. And leading everyone, the first are the Muhajirs and the Ansar, and those who followed them with virtue, Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased Him, and He has kept ready for them gardens beneath which rivers flow, to abide in it forever and ever. This is the great attainment. The polytheists of Mecca could not digest the settlement and spread of Islam in Medina and they were trying to cause mischief in Medina through hypocrites disguised as Muslims and Jews living in Medina in order to destroy Islam and Muslims. The polytheists of Mecca agreed with them and asked them not to give comfort to the Muslims in Medina and threatened that if they did not listen and protected them they would attack Medina with all their might and would not lead anyone alive. In addition, they did not give the Muslims comfort in Medina by sending bandits and small groups and plundering the herds and fields of the Muslims. Moreover, the polytheists of Mecca confiscated all the goods and property belonging to the Muhajirs in Mecca. Muslims were absolutely not allowed to perform their pilgrimage duties. The situation had become very delicate and more dangerous. Muslims stood guard in the streets of Medina at night and took all kinds of precautions against the possibility of sudden attacks from Jews and polytheists. The events began to unfold in such a way that the Messenger of Allah no longer had the opportunity to live in peace with the policy of patience and tolerance that he had followed until that day. It was not possible to live Islam without an Islamic state. As a matter of fact, when the Prophet saw that it was not enough for them to remain in a position of defense after patience and endurance, he took refuge in his Lord and waited for the next revelation. Finally, at a time when the polytheists were becoming more and more violent, the verses that allowed the jihad, which had become a necessity for the preservation of religion, homeland and believers, were revealed. Fight in the way of Allah, those who fight against you, but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. O you who have believed, take your precaution and go forth in companies, or go forth altogether. The Almighty explained the reason and goal of the war in this verse. Fight them until there is no fitna and the religion is completely Allah's. The order of war came from Allahu Azimu Shan. It was time to stop defending and go on the offensive. After those holy statements, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his followers started to get ready in every aspect to fight against the polytheists. The Messenger of Allah sent troops out of Medina to keep Medina and its surroundings under control and established relations with the non-Muslim states in the vicinity, making peace treaties and explaining Islam to them. The number of Muslims was increasing day by day and the Islamic State was getting stronger. Between the Muslims and the polytheists of Mecca, the law of war had now come into force. In response to the Meccan polytheists' attacks on preventing Islam, the Muslims also counterattacked. Medina was on the trade route, the lifeblood of the polytheists of Mecca. 
The Muslims took advantage of this and prevented the Meccans from taking goods to Syria and trade by keeping the routes through which the trade caravans passed. These caravan attacks were made only on the caravans belonging to the Meccans, whom they were in war with, and the caravans of other non-Muslim states, whom they were not fighting against, were not touched. Many Seriyas and Ghazwas were organized against the polytheists of Mecca, such as the Seriya of Sif ul Bahur, the Ghazwa of Abba, and the Batna Nahla expedition. That year, a very large caravan of the polytheists of Mecca was returning from the eastern Roman city of Damascus. This caravan was a large trade caravan consisting of 1000 camels with a capital as large as 50,000 dinars. At the head of the caravan were 30 or 40 people such as Abu Sufyan and Amr bin As, the leading figures of Mecca. The polytheists of Quraysh knew that the Muslims would retaliate for preventing them from performing the pilgrimage and seizing their property in Mecca. Abu Sufyan sent a man to Mecca to say that the caravan would be attacked by Muslims and asked them to gather an army and come to protect the caravan. When the news reached Mecca that the Muslims were going to attack the Quraysh caravan, the polytheists were terrified and angry. To protect the caravan goods, all the Meccans, except Abu Lahab, gathered an armored army of about a thousand men, consisting of 100 horses and 700 camels to fight, and set off for the caravan. The Messenger of Allah set out from Medina with an army of 313 men. 64 of the army were from the Muhajirs, and the rest from the Ansar. Three were horsemen, 70 of them were riding camels, and the others were pedestrians. The Prophet had previously sent scouts to investigate the caravan. The two scouts reached the better wells to make the camels drink water and made their camels sit. They heard two girls from the tribe of Juhayna talking at the wellhead. The girls were talking about the caravan, staying in the valley of Rahwa tomorrow or the next day. When the Sahabis heard this, they set out to inform the Prophet of the situation. Two miles away from Rahwa, they reached the Messenger of Allah and informed him of the situation. The Prophet then moved his army in the direction of Badr. At that time, Abu Sufyan had brought the caravan to the wells of Badr. He was thinking of staying here overnight but he was afraid of being spied out. He asked Mejdi if he had noticed anyone. Mejdi said, I have never seen anyone I don't like or an enemy between you and Medina. If there is an enemy between you and Medina, it will not be hidden to us and I am not going to hide it from you. But I saw two strangers on their mounds. Here they made their camels drink water. He pointed to the place where the companions had their camels sit. Abu Sufyan took the camel's excrement in his hand and crumbled it. Inside he saw a palm kernel. This is the date of Medina. The men here are also Muhammad's spies. I think they are close here. He gave up staying here. He turned the direction of the caravan towards the coast and began to move rapidly, taking Badr to his left. When he realized that he had secured the caravan, he said to the polytheists, You set out from the caravan. Allah saved it. Get back now. Upon Abu Sufyan's news, the sons of Zuhra and the sons of Adi bin Kaab returned. Abu Jahil said, We will not return until we reach Badr. We are going to sit there for three days, slaughter camels, eat and drink. Women will dance and sing. The Arabs in the vicinity will hear us too, and from now on, they will always be afraid of us. When Abu Sufyan heard that the Quraysh army had not returned in obedience to Abu Jahl, he said, Woe to my people, this is Abu Jahl's work. The fact that he does not want to go back is because of his love of being the head of people. It is wildness, and wildness brings shortage and misfortune. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, realized that they were facing an inevitable life or death war now because he was following political progresses step by step and gathered his companions. He asked them, do you think it is more appropriate to follow the caravan or to meet the Quraysh army? 
On behalf of the Muhajirs, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma stood up and expressed their readiness to meet the Quraysh army. In the name of Ansar, Sa'ad bin Muaz radiallahu an stood up and said, O oh, the Messenger of Allah, we believed in you. We have witnessed that the Quran you have brought is true. Do as you wish. If you dive into the sea, we will dive with you. Not a single person from the Ansar will return. Upon these words of loyalty and submission, the blessed figure of the Prophet was filled with a smile. He prayed for charity and said, So let us walk with the blessing of Allah. Good news to you that Allah has promised one of the two groups. It is as if I see the place where the Quraysh will be destroyed on the battlefield. The two armies lined up against each other in the battlefield on Friday, the 17th of Ramadan. It was a very hot day. Until then, Arabs always fought with a sense of tribe such as lineage, race and kinship. Now, religion had replaced the tribe. The sense of religious exaltation had eliminated the kinship temper that was so strong among the Arabs, such that some close relatives like father, uncle, child, sibling, cousin were on opposite sides. That day, Abu Bakr radiallahu an and his son, Abu Ubaidah radiallahu an and his father, Hamza radiallahu an and his brother were foes. There is a great example for you in the case of these two groups that are facing each other. One is a group that fights in the cause of Allah and the other is a group of unbelievers who see them as twice as self. Allah supports whoever he wills with his help. Of course, there is a great example for those who are prudent in this. Three people from the Quraysh came forward and asked for three heroes from the Muslims. Thereupon, Hazrat Hamza, Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Ubaidah appeared before them. Hazrat Hamza and Hazrat Ali easily knocked out their opponents. Hazrat Ubaidah was wounded in the leg. Thereupon, with the order of Abu Jahl, the polytheistic army started the attack. In the Muslim lines, there were Allahu Akbar and La ilaha illallah shouts, which rose in a frightening pomegranate towards the ranks of blasphemy, never stopped, but excited the faithful hearts. Finally, the Messenger of Allah gave the order to attack. The two armies collided horribly. The fighting began violently and became increasingly violent. The Messenger of Allah ran among them to increase the zeal and enthusiasm of his companions and often recited this verse. That community will be defeated and they will turn around and flee. After these words, the Prophet turned to Abu Bakr radiallahu an, who was with him and said, Good news, Gabriel and the angels came for help. Allah sent his angels to help the army of Islam. The lines of Badr attacked the polytheist army with all their might.
The Battle of Badr was the struggle for the existence of Islam and faith. The Almighty also mobilized the army of angels in this war. The companions who participated in this first great jihad had the honor of being the most virtuous of the Muslims. The angels who participated in this holy duty in Badr also gained a greater honor than the other angels. The Islamic army gave 14 murders that day, while 70 polytheists were killed, including Abu Jahl of the Quraysh army. This battle was the first great victory of the Islamic State established in Medina. All over Arabia, the news that the polytheists of Mecca had been defeated by the army of Islam spread. The number of the people who want to convert to Islam began to increase. The control of the Badr wells and the Damascus trade routes had passed into the hands of the Muslims. The peace treaty between the Muslims and the Jews was broken because the Jews living in Medina did not keep their promises to the Muslims and help the polytheists of Quraysh. Therefore, the Jews were besieged by the Muslims in Medina and forced to emigrate. After Abu Jahl's death in Badr, Abu Sufyan became the head of the Quraysh. Quraysh notables, whose relatives were killed by Muslims, swore revenge. After the Battle of Badr, the number of Muslims gradually increased and it became known to everyone that an Islamic state was established on the territory of Arabia. The Prophet peace be upon him told Muslims about the martyrdom. He heralded to Muslims that martyrdom in the way of Allah is the highest authority after prophethood that all sins of the martyr are forgiven except for the rights of servants and that the suffering of death of a martyr will be as much as the bite of an ant. This was a great blessing from Allah to the believers. Every Muslim longed to be a martyr in the cause of Allah. In Mecca, there was a great atmosphere of mourning. Almost everyone in Mecca lost a relative in the Battle of Badr. The polytheists of Mecca were filled with the grudge of avenging Badr. As a result, not long after, the surrounding Arabs were asked for help and an army of 3,000 polytheists with their hearts on fire of revenge was prepared. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, who was in Mecca at the time, wrote the preparation made in Mecca in a letter and sent it to Medina and warned the Muslims. The Messenger of Allah immediately convened the War Council. He consulted with his companions whether to stay in Medina and wage a defensive war or whether to go out of the city and conduct an offensive war. Although the Prophet was in favor of staying in Medina and making a war of defense, in the end it was decided to go out of the city and conduct an offensive war in accordance with the decision of the majority. The Prophet peace be upon him brought his army to Mount Uhud, a red mountain one mile north of Medina. The Prophet had given the banner to Musab bin Umair, the cavalry command to Zubair bin Awwa and the army command to Hazrat Hamza. Fifty archers who were good marksmen were placed on the hill of Ainain under the command of Abdullah bin Jubair. Allah's messenger intended this to prevent a possible attack from behind the lines. 
he gave the following precise order to the archers. You are going to keep our bags, whether the enemy is victorious or defeated. Never leave your places unless you hear from me. The polytheists of the Quraysh also came to the battlefield and lined up the army. The right flank of the army was commanded by Khalid bin Walid. On the left flank was placed Abu Jahid San Ikrima, and the cavalry was headed by Safwan bin Umayya. The commander of the general headquarters was Abu Sufyan, and the reserve commander was Amr bin As. The Prophet addressed his army and said, O oh people, undoubtedly jihad is difficult to commit. The trouble of war is tough. There are few people who are patient with the jihad, except those whom Allah has led to the right path. There is no doubt that Allah is with those who obey Him. Do not depart from what Allah has commanded you. Know that controversy, argument and discouragement are things that Allah does not like because of weakness. Those who are in this situation are not given victory. The situation of the believer according to the believer is similar to the situation of the head according to the body. When the head is disturbed, the whole corpse is disturbed by it. Wassalamu alaikum. Since the polytheists were hurting so much in Badr, they rushed to the army of Islam with hatred and the desire to take revenge as soon as possible. The Islamic army was waiting for the Prophet's order to attack. When the Prophet brought takbir with his unique voice, the companions attacked by saying Allah Allah in unison. The Muslims were fighting with such zeal that the army of the polytheists was gradually becoming less. When Ubay bin Khalaf, one of the polytheists, rode his horse at full speed on the Prophet in that chaos, the Prophet peace be upon him, threw the spear in his blessed head and dropped him from his horse. The polytheistic army, superior in numbers and equipment, could no longer bear the Muslims fighting with unprecedented fervor and began to retreat en masse. After chasing the enemy for a while and making sure of their victory, the Muslims set out to collect beauty. The archers who saw this victory from the hill of archers left their places and rushed to collect beauty despite the warning of the Messenger of Allah. Abdullah bin Jubayr could not keep them in their places. Despite his insistent warning, only eight people remained on the hill who remained loyal to the order of the Prophet. Whatever happened, happened after that. Khalid bin Walid, one of the enemy's vigilant commanders, had his eye on the archers. When he saw the archers leave their positions, he seized the opportunity he had been waiting for. With the cavalry unit under his command, they immediately went around behind the hill where the archers were located and launched a fierce attack from behind the Muslims who were collecting beauty.
when the enemy soldiers who had been defeated and were fleeing saw this situation, they immediately turned back and attacked the Muslims again. The Islamic army was caught between two fires. At this moment, Hazrat Hamza, the valiant warrior of Islam, who was running from side to side among the ranks, was murdered by a spear thrown by a slave named Wahshi. Wahshi did this in order to attain the freedom promised to him by Abu Sufyan's wife Hind. The martyrdom of Hazrat Hamza caused an atmosphere of mourning in the Muslim ranks. The already mixed ranks have deteriorated. The polytheists murdered many of the believers that day. A group of polytheists even attacked the messenger of Allah directly. The believers jumped in front of the arrows fired at the Prophet and shielded his body to protect him. In the meantime, Utba, one of the polytheists, threw a large stone at the Prophet. This stone hit the Prophet in the face. The Prophet's helmet split his cheek and broke a tooth. At that moment, the earth and the sky trembled. In the meantime, the Prophet fell into one of the pits that Abu Amir, a wicked person, had dug for the Muslims. At that moment, the polytheists thought that the Prophet was dead and made the fuss that Muhammad had been killed. The polytheists were overwhelmed by their joy. Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Talha brought him out of the pit. Then the Prophet said, Allah is so wrathful to the people who endured the face of his messenger. When the companions began to shout, The Messenger of Allah is alive! The companions ran to him and built a wall of flesh around him. The joys of the polytheists who heard this disappeared and they headed in that direction. They started raining arrows on the Messenger of Allah. These arrows hit the companions. Some were wounded and some were murdered. Saad bin Abi Waqqas was killing the polytheists who approached with arrows. The Prophet gave an arrow to him and said, Shoot, O Saad, shoot. May my parents be sacrificed to you. The Islamic army began to retreat towards Mount Uhud. The Messenger of Allah said, O servants of Allah, come to me. I am the Messenger of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares this situation as follows. While you were killing your enemies by Allah's leave, Allah fulfilled his promise to you. Finally, there came a moment when you fell into weakness after Allah showed you what you desire. You tried to argue about the order and you became rebellious. There were those who wanted the world and there were those who wanted the hereafter. Thereafter, Allah turned you away from them in order to test you. And he has forgiven you. In fact, Allah is very gracious to believers. On that terrible day, despite everything, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, never left his place like a pole star and resisted with great skill.
With his courage and perseverance, he set a superior example to his companions in carriage, because the Almighty said, And be not infirm, and be not grieving, and you shall have the upper hand if you are believers. If a want has afflicted you, it has also afflicted the people, and we bring these days to men by turns, and that Allah may know those who believe and take witnesses from among you, and Allah does not love the unjust. The polytheists were now becoming ineffective against the Muslims. In this fearful moment, Allah Ta'ala blessed the believers with a state of sleep, and they fell into a sweet and peaceful sleep where they were. The polytheists were frightened and began to return. One of the miracles given to the Prophet peace be upon him was that he instilled fear in the hearts of the enemy even from a distance. With the effect of this fear that fell on their hearts, the polytheists could not attempt to invade Medina, which was completely defenseless. Despite the temporary victory, they provided against the Muslims. Moreover, they returned without taking a single prisoner from the Muslims. Without a doubt, this was a blessing from Allah to his Prophet and the believers. On that day, 70 companions were murdered in Uhud. Among them were such braves as Hazrat Hamza and Musa bin Umair. The believers descended on the battlefield, buried the martyrs and offered funeral prayers. The companions who did not pay attention to the instructions of the Prophet and descended from the archers for beauty were very sad about the responsibility of defeat. The Prophet, peace be upon him, addressed them. Don't be sorry, you're forgiven. The conquest of Mecca is also imminent. In Uhud, on the one hand, in a great ecstasy of faith, patience, trust, submission and consent to fate were displayed at the peak level. On the other hand, very painful tests were also faced due to weaknesses such as a momentary ignorance and inclination to the world. The negligence shown in carrying out the command of Allah's Messenger changed the course of the war in an instant and caused the victory to be delayed. The mistakes of a few people resulted in everyone getting into trouble. The polytheists were given a deceptive victory that would have no practical consequences. With this deceptive victory, the hatred and anger that had accumulated in the hearts of the polytheists since Badr had calmed down and their violence and coldness towards Islam had decreased over time. And be not infirm and be not grieving and you shall have the upper hand if you are believers. After the Battle of Uhud, the polytheists of the Quraysh thought that they had taken their revenge on the Muslims and found peace. Not long after, the Jews of Bani Nadir in Medina tried to assassinate the Messenger of Allah. When the Prophet peace be upon him, who survived this assassination by Allah's declaration, saw that the Jews had exceeded their limits, he besieged their homeland because there was nothing else to do. When the Jews realized that they could not longer withstand the Muslims, they surrendered. The Messenger of Allah exiled the tribe of Bani Nadir from Medina. He allowed other Jewish tribes to stay in their places on the condition that they were faithful to their treaties. Some of the Jews of Bani Nadir migrated to the castle of Khaybar and the others to Damascus. The Jews who took refuge in Khaybar were burning with the fire of revenge against the Muslims. In the castle of Khaybar, they were plotting with other Jews and thinking about how they could defeat the Muslims. They decided to send a Jewish delegation of 10 to 15 people to Mecca. 
an alliance was made between the polytheists of Quraysh and the Jews of Khaybar. The Meccan polytheists were waiting for such an opportunity and took action immediately. While the Quraysh sent envoys to all Arab lands and invited them to fight against the Messenger of Allah, the Jews were also trying to gather other Jewish tribes. The Quraysh and Jews managed to gather a large army of more than 10,000 soldiers and set out to Medina. The Messenger of Allah, who heard what happened, consulted with his companions. He promised them that they would receive divine help if they did not rebel against Allah's orders and if they faced difficulties in the way of Allah. Then, as a result of his consultation with his companions about what strategy should be followed against the unbelievers, it was decided to dig trenches around Medina. Medina was open and in danger from only one side. On the other side, it was surrounded by adjacent buildings like a castle. After the Messenger of Allah decided where the trenches would be opened, he gave each of them a certain place to dig by showing them from here to there. Together with the Prophet peace be upon him, all Muslims were working on the digging of trenches. Those with beautiful voices recited poems, and even the poems that were recited were accompanied by the Messenger of Allah from time to time. Everyone was working heartily for this work. The polytheists and their Jewish armies were united and came to Medina. They were stunned by the trenches dug by the Muslims and could not enter Medina. The Prophet was positioned behind the trenches with his 3000 Mujahideen and the remaining women and children were placed in castles and fortresses. However, the Bani Qurayza Jews in Medina rebelled and broke the agreement between them and the Messenger of Allah. The Jews sent a message to Abu Sufyan and said, be patient, we will attack the Muslims from behind, we will destroy them. This betrayal was very heavy on the Messenger of Allah, but he was always in a state of submission to Allah. Therefore, in the face of this situation, he said, Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for us. He is a good guardian. The Jews in Medina were planning to attack and capture Muslim women and children, while the men were at the trenches. The Prophet peace be upon him sent a force of 500 men to the streets of Medina. These companions would patrol the streets of Medina with low tech beers and protect women and children. Days passed between the siege of the polytheists and the betrayal of the Jews. When the morning came out without being raided by the Jews of Beni Qurayza, the believers breathed the sigh of relief. Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu an said, The fear we felt from Beni Qurayza about our children in Medina was more than the fear we felt from the armies of Quraysh and Ghatafan. From time to time, I climbed to the top of Mount Sela and watched the houses of Medina and praised and thanked Allah as I saw them in peace and tranquility. On the other hand, the area around the trench was frequently raided by polytheists and fierce fights took place until late at night. Everyone was taking part in the war and the Messenger of Allah was personally guarding the narrowest place of the trench where the polytheists were trying to pass. The war was going on and on. The believers were in such a difficult situation that they began to wait for when Allah's help would come. Allah says in a state, When they came upon you from below you and from above you, and when the eyes turned dull and the hearts rose up to the throats, and you began to think diverse thoughts of Allah, there the believers were tried and they were shaken with severe shaking and when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts was a disease began to say Allah and his messenger did not promise us but only to deceive and when a party of them said O people of Yazrib there is no place to stand for you therefore go back and a party of them asked permission of the Prophet saying surely our houses are exposed 
and they were not exposed. They only desired to escape. If they were asked to cause sedition, they would do so immediately. And it is true that they had previously promised Allah that they would not turn their backs and flee. A promise to Allah requires accountability. Say, if you are fleeing death or being killed, running away will never help you. And when the believers saw the allies, they said, This is what Allah and his messenger promised us. And Allah and his messenger spoke the truth, and it only increased them in faith and submission. Thus, the believers struggled with all their might. Nuaim radiallahu an, one of the notables of Katafan Jews, who converted to Islam but hit himself, managed to break the alliance between the polytheists and the Bani Quraiza Jews. The tribes besieging Medina fell into dispute. Finally, the Jews withdrew from the siege, falling in Nuaim's tricks. Only polytheists remained in the battlefield as enemies. However, the believers were still in a very difficult situation. At a time when the Prophet and his companions were going through a severe test under the siege of the polytheists and when their hearts rose up to their throats, the following verse was revealed. Or do you think that you would enter the garden while yet the state of those who have passed away before you has not come upon you? Distress and affliction befell them, and they were shaken violently, so that the messenger and those who believed with him said, When will the help of Allah come? No, surely the help of Allah is nigh. The messenger of Allah raised his hands and prayed as follows, O my Lord, O Allah who sent the Quran, O my Lord who calls to the enemies to account, scatter those Arab tribes that gather in front of Medina, O oh Allah, do not let them unite, weaken their will, so that they fell apart. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, had just finished this prayer when his blessed figures were enlightened with a smile, and the divine help that overwhelmed everyone with happiness accrued. A harsh and sharp storm began to blow onto the enemy ranks. A terrible whirlwind that threw whatever came before it filled the dust and soil of the Medina Valley into the faces and eyes of the polytheists. It ripped off their tents, it put out their fire, it mixed up camels and cavalry horses. The polytheists upon whom this divine disaster and torment rained down fell into a state of misery and they started running without looking back. Allah sent help to those who believed. Who believe, remember Allah's blessing on you. You know, when armies attacked you, we sent a wind against them, and armies that you didn't see. Allah saw very well what you are doing. Allah turned away those unbelievers with anger and hatred without any benefit. Allah's help in the war was sufficient for the believers. Allah is mighty and the absolute winner. The polytheists who fled in a miserable state left behind many spoils. Thanks to them, the famine in Medina was eliminated. After this divine grace and great victory, the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him said to his companions, Now the guard is yours. From now on, 
the Quraysh cannot come upon you. Thus, he stated that they could no longer go on the defensive, but also on the offensive, because both the pride and the offensive power of the polytheists were completely broken. From now on, in the hearts of all believers, the words of the Messenger of Allah expressing this truth were being chanted. From now on, we will march on them. The Battle of the Trench had been a victory for the believers, and the enemy had returned to Mecca in defeat. Like the Jews before them, Banu Quraiza did not honor the covenant they had made with the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him, and betrayed him in the most difficult times. However, according to the agreement, they were supposed to defend themselves with the Muslims against the polytheists attacking Medina. When they had the opportunity, they betrayed them and dragged themselves to destruction with their own hands. Upon receiving the divine command from Gabriel the Prophet peace be upon him, immediately gathered the believers and marched on Banu Quraiza. The Messenger of Allah came to the fortress of Banu Quraiza and invited them to Islam, but they didn't accept. Then the fortress was besieged. Unable to hold out for long, the Quraizans surrendered. The Messenger of Allah punished the Jews according to the ruling of the Torah. The punishment of traitors in the Torah was the execution of the men who held arms, confiscation of their property and the captivity of their women and children. Allah brought down from their fortresses those of the people of the book who helped them and put fear in their hearts. You were killing some of them and taking some of them captive. Allah made you inheritors of their places, their homes, their property and the land where you had not set foot. Thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also signaled to the believers the conquest of Khaybar. Khaybar was a large city to the north of Medina and four mansions away from Medina. There were many fortresses around the city. Some of the Jews who had made the area around Medina their home had been expelled and some had been killed. Most of those who remained were gathered in Khaybar. The Jews in Khaybar never stopped and turned Khaybar into a cauldron of sedition. Medina was located between Khaybar and Mecca. Therefore, Whenever there was a war with the polytheists of Mecca, the Jews of Khaybar, who remained behind the Muslims, posed a danger. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, then made a 10-year peace treaty with the Meccan polytheists at Hudaybiyah. Thus, when the Muslims marched on Khaybar, they would be safe from attack by the Meccans. After completing his preparations, the Messenger of Allah marched on Khaybar. After a grueling struggle, the city of Khaybar was completely conquered. The Muslims took a lot of beauty from the city. During the 10-year peace treaty with the Meccan polytheists, the Prophet, peace be upon him, found a comfortable opportunity to spread Islam. He sent envoys to the neighboring states, inviting them to Islam. One of these envoys was Harith bin Umair. Harith bin Umair took the Prophet's letter to the Christian Ghassanids, who were then part of Eastern Rome. However, the Eastern Roman governor of Palestine, Shurahbil, murdered the messenger of the Prophet. However, even enemy countries would not touch each other's envoys in accordance with the understanding that the messenger is invulnerable. The Prophet was very fond of his companions and would be very disturbed if one of them was in trouble. For this reason, he could not stand by and watch the insolent murder of one of his companions and immediately prepared an army of 3,000 men. 
The Prophet led this army to the valley of Saniyatul Wada and gave them the following instructions. I have appointed Zayd bin Haritha as commander. If Zayd bin Haritha is murdered, let Jafar bin Abu Talib take his place. If Jafar bin Abu Talib is murdered, Abdullah bin Ravaha will succeed him. If Abdullah bin Ravaha is also murdered, let the Muslims choose a suitable person from among them and make him their commander. Then, the Prophet ascended the Saniyatul Wada hill and addressed the Islamic army as follows. Go forth in the name of Allah. Fight the enemies of Allah and your enemy in Damascus. In Damascus, you will find men in seclusion and worshipping in churches. Do not interfere with them. You will also find some clerics who are servants of the devil. At the heads are the nests of Zatan. Remove those nests with swords. Do not kill women, suckling children and old people. Do not cut down dates and trees. Do not destroy houses. After saying these words, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, saw them off. The other Muslims also said goodbye to them and gave them their farewells. Khalid bin Walid, who had surrounded the Muslims from behind in the Battle of Uhud and caused their defeat, had also converted to Islam and joined the Zami. The Islamic army moved towards the region of Muta. Meanwhile, the governor, who learned that the Muslims were coming for them, asked for support from Eastern Rome. The Eastern Roman Emperor Heraclius had just finished the Sassanid campaign and returned to Istanbul. He had left most of his army in Mesopotamia. He sent the army under the command of one of his generals, Theodoros, to meet the Islamic army. According to Muslim historians, when the Christian Arabs learned of the arrival of the Eastern Roman armies, they joined the army and formed a huge army numbering nearly a hundred thousand. According to Eastern Roman historians, a small contingent was sent from local Roman garrisons. Modern historians estimate the number of this army to be around 10,000. In any case, the Eastern Roman army was at least three times bigger than the Islamic army. The news reached the Islamic army that Eastern Rome was coming against them with an army of 100,000 men. When this news came to the Muslims, they stayed in Ma'an for two nights. Let us send a message to the Messenger of Allah. Either he will turn us back or he will send us additional men. While people were discussing these thoughts, Abdullah bin Ravaha, known as the Prophet's poet, encouraged them. By Allah, we do not fight people with numbers, weapons or horses. We fight people only because of this religion that Allah has honored us with. Continue on your way. By Allah, we remember that in Badr we had only two horses. On the day of Uhud, we had one horse. Our share is one of two beauties. Either we will be victorious or we will be murdered. So, the Islamic army, which did not retreat, confronted the great Roman army on the field of Muta. Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, I participated in the battle of Muta and when we saw the polytheists, we saw an army that was too great for us to overcome in terms of the number of soldiers, weapons, horses, silk, atlas and gold. I was dazzled. Thabit bin Arkam said to me, O oh Abu Huraira, what is happening to you? It is as if you are seeing great armies. I said, yes. Thabit said, did you see us at Badr? We did not achieve victory through numbers. After a period of silent waiting, the battle horn of the Roman army sounded. A central infantry unit of Christian Arabs charged towards the Islamic army. On the order of Zayd bin Haritha, the commander of the Islamic army, the Muslims also rushed forward. After a very short battle, Zayd bin Haritha was seriously wounded by a spear blow. At this very moment, the Prophet peace be upon him was sitting on the pulpit and the battlefield was visible to him. Zayd is now a murderer. Ask forgiveness for him. He ran into paradise. Jafar bin Abu Talib took the banner that had fallen from Zayd's hand. Encouraging the Muslims, he told them to fight with all their might and entered the ranks of the enemy at the forefront. 
the Muslims were energized and attacked rapidly and began to melt the Christian Arab armies. At that moment, when the Christian Arabs suffered many casualties and began to retreat, loud trumpets were heard from the Roman army. Jafar bin Abu Talib stopped the Muslims and relied them. He ordered them to get ready. The fully equipped Greek troops of the Roman army quickly attacked. Thereupon, the right and left wings of the Islamic army rushed forward and met the enemy all together. Jafar bin Abu Talib was the first to meet the enemy at the front of the troops and was alone among dozens of Greek soldiers. He was knocking down a Greek with every sword blow, but he was also receiving sword blows from various parts of his body. Although he lost both arms from the sword blows of the Greeks, he was trying not to let the Islamic banner fall to the ground by clutching it to his chest. A large Greek soldier cut Jafar bin Abu Talib in half with a large sword in his hand. Only then did Jafar al Tayyar and the banner fall to the ground. Jafar bin Abu Talib was murdered. Ask Allah's forgiveness for your brother because he is a murderer. He entered paradise. He was given two wings of rubies in paradise. After the martyrdom of Jafar bin Abu Talib, the Muslims became fearful. But Abdullah bin Ravaha raised the banner from where it had fallen and ordered the Muslims to attack. The right and left wings were in bad shape. The enemy was very numerous and well equipped. The right and left wings were fighting and slowly retreating. When Abdullah bin Ravaha received his word blow, the fear of death fell in his heart. Abdullah bin Ravaha was wounded and murdered. He entered paradise by protesting. When he was wounded, he became afraid. Then he became courageous by condemning his nafs. He was murdered and entered paradise. Towards evening, after the martyrdom of Abdullah bin Ravaha, the Muslims were left without a leader and began to retreat in defeat. But although the Greeks seemed to have gained the upper hand, they had suffered many casualties. The Muslims gathered on a high hill and were about to collapse when Thabit bin Erkam proposed that they unite and give the banner and the command of the army to Khalid bin Walid. Khalid bin Walid, who took charge of the army, consulted and decided what to do. In the morning, the two armies faced each other again. Khalid bin Walid had completely changed the formation of the Islamic army by moving those on the right wing to the left wing, those on the left wing to the right wing, those in front of the center to the rear and those in the rear to the front. Thus, he wanted to give the enemy the impression that new reinforcements were coming. The Greek armies on the other hand were determined to drive the Muslims back completely. The trumpets were blown and the soldiers charged. Khalid bin Walid advised the Muslims to be steadfast and to fight back when in danger and surrounded by the enemy so as not to be encircled. The Greek soldiers and the Muslim soldiers quickly engaged each other. However, none of the Greek soldiers saw the soldiers they had fought yesterday. They were seeing the Islamic soldiers for the first time. Inwardly fearful, they said to each other that these must be the newly arrived Islamic soldiers. Finally, a sword from the swords of Allah took the banner. When Khalid bin Walid ordered to charge forwards in waves, the Muslims began to attack with all their might, chanting takbirs.
the Greek soldiers, exhausted and frightened, slowly began to retreat. Seeing that his soldiers were retreating, the Greek commander Theodorus ordered his troops to attack all together in order to reach a final result. Encouraged by the incoming troops, the Greeks also found courage and turned back. Khalid bin Walid, who saw the Greeks attacking with all their might, knew that he could not deal with such a large army, but at least he aimed to leave this place with the least damage while inflicting the maximum damage he could inflict on his enemies. He pointed to the hills and ordered his army to fight their way there and retreat. The Greeks put tremendous pressure on the Muslims, however, the Islamic soldiers were inflicting great damage on the Greeks as they slowly retreated and did not stop fighting. When the Muslims finally reached the top of the hill, the Greek soldiers did not dare to go up the hill because they were afraid that reinforcements would come to the Muslims from behind the hill and they would be ambushed. At the same time, the Muslims were driving them away with arrow shots. General Theodorus then ordered his troops to retreat to avoid further casualties. The command displayed by Khalid bin Walid that day made the Muslims admire him. He both inflicted great casualties on the Roman army and ensured that the Islamic army returned with the least casualties and a lot of beauty. He was given the nickname Saifullah, the Sword of Allah, by our Prophet, peace be upon him. One of the conditions of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah between the Muslims and the Quraysh in 628 was this. During the 10 year period of the peace treaty, whoever wishes can enter into the covenant of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and whoever wishes can enter into the covenant of Quraysh. After this agreement, the tribe of Huza immediately said, We enter into the covenant of Muhammad. The tribe of Banu Bakr also jumped up and said, we enter into the covenant of the Quraysh. There was a war between the tribe of Husa and the tribe of Banu Bakr in the days of Jahiliyyah. Because of the emergence of Islam, they had given up fighting and had withdrawn their hands from each other. But the enmity between them was still there. Now the tribe of Husa was under the protection of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And the tribe of Banu Bakr was under the protection of Quraysh. For 17 or 18 months after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, both sides remained silent. Until a man named Anas bin Zunaym from Banu Bakr insulted the Prophet. Unable to remain silent in the face of these insults, a young man from the tribe of Huza beat and wounded the insulter. When the man returned to his tribe and explained the situation, the tribe of Banu Bakr started demanding blood price on the pretext of the man's wound. The elite of Banu Bakr went to meet the Quraysh. They asked the Quraysh to help them with men and weapons against their enemies, the tribe of Huza. The Quraysh said, Muhammad does not know what we are doing now. It is night time and no one will see us. They agreed to help with weapons and mounts. 
So, they agreed and attacked the tribe of Husa at night in weather at a time when the Husa were resting. Amr bin Salim, who escaped from this raid by escaping on his horse, came to the messenger of Allah in Medina. He informed him of what had happened. The Quraysh broke their promise to you. They broke the covenant they made with you at Hudaybiyah. They caught us unawares in Wadir, in our own land. They killed us while we were sleeping, bowing and prostrating. They thought that I would not and could not call anyone for help. O Prophet, call the servants of Allah for help. Let the Messenger of Allah be among them. May he turn from color to color in anger at the oppression, and may he be at the head of a great army, foaming like the seas. The Messenger of Allah stood up and said, If I do not help the Husa with what I have helped myself, I shall not be helped either. I swear by Allah, in whose mighty hand is my existence, that I will protect them as I protect myself and my household. Now, spread the news to the earth that those who believe in Allah and the last day should gather in Medina. Upon this call, as many Muslims as there were began to gather in Medina. When Abu Sufyan became aware of this situation, he came to Medina to talk to the Messenger of Allah and prevent him from attacking. No matter who he went to in Medina, everyone turned away from him. He could not get any result and returned to Mecca. When the Quraysh learned that Abu Sufyan had returned without any result, they were alarmed. All the Muslims would soon flock to Mecca. The Messenger of Allah and his army set out from Medina and moved to Mecca. They camped in a place close to Mecca. Abu Sufyan entered the presence of the Messenger of Allah and became a Muslim. Abu Sufyan said, For the sake of Allah, forgive your people. You are the best of people, the most well-behaved, the most mild-tempered, the most merciful, the most observant of kinship rights. O oh, Messenger of Allah, did you order the killing of your people? The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, No, I did not order that. Today is the day of mercy. The Prophet said that anyone who put down his sword in Mecca and entered his house and closed the door of his house would be given amnesty and no harm would be done to anyone who did not resist. In Mecca, polytheists such as Safwan bin Umayyah Ikrima bin Abu Jahil and Suhail bin Amr were inviting Meccans to fight against the Islamic army. Some of the Quraysh responded to this invitation, took up arms and swore that they would not let the Prophet enter Mecca without a fight. When the Prophet peace be upon him learned that the Meccans were preparing to attack, he put the Islamic army in battle formation he divided his army into four parts, the right arm, the left arm, the heart and the vanguard. The Prophet peace be upon him said to his army commanders, Your meeting place with me is the hill of Safa. Do not fight with anyone unless he draws a weapon against you. Abu Sufyan then decided to go to Mecca to warn the Quraysh. The Prophet peace be upon him told him the following, Whoever takes refuge in the house of Abu Sufyan is given safety. 
Whoever takes refuge in the house of Hakim bin Hizam will be given safety. Whoever lays down his weapons, closes his door and takes refuge in his house is given safety. Those who saw Abu Sufyan coming began to insult him and march on him because he was a Muslim. Abu Sufyan said, Shame on you, do not deceive yourselves. He has come to you with armies that you cannot stand against, that you cannot withstand. I have seen what you cannot see. I have seen countless soldiers, horses and weapons that no one can afford. Whoever enters Abu Sufyan's house is given security. Whoever leaves his weapons and enters his house and closes the door, he is given safety. Whoever takes refuge in the Kaaba, unarmed, is given safety. Zubair bin Awam, as the commander of the left column, began to enter Mecca from the upper side of Mecca. Everyone on that side had thrown their weapons out of the windows and shut themselves in their houses. Therefore, there was no clash. The right column entered from below Mecca under the command of Khalid bin Walid. A group of polytheists led by Abu Jahil son Ikrima, Umayyah son Safwan, and Amr's son Suhail confronted Khalid bin Walid and started shooting arrows at the Muslims. Khalid bin Walid shouted to his soldiers, Fight them! Those who can be killed are to be killed. Do not kill those who are defeated and try to escape to their homes. Then the horsemen quickly rode towards the polytheists. And after about a minute of fighting, the polytheists began to scatter and flee. At the heart of the army, the Prophet peace be upon him, with his black turban and white banner, was reciting Surah al fat aloud and bowing his head in gratitude and humility to Allah as he marched towards Mecca. As he ascended the slope of Al-Azahir, the flash of swords was seen in the city of Mecca. The Messenger of Allah asked, What are these flashes? Was not Khalid bin Walid forbidden to fight? Didn't I forbid fighting? O Messenger of Allah, we believe that the polytheists tried to fight Khalid bin Walid. If they had not started the battle, Khalid would not have fought them. Khalid bin Walid was ordered not to kill anyone in Mecca. When the city calmed down, the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him entered the city. After saluting Hajar al Aswad with his baton, he called out the Takbir, Allahu Akbar. The Muslims began to shout the Takbir in unison, Mecca, shook with the sound of Takbir. All the idols around the Kaaba were destroyed one by one. After the tawafs were done and the tawaf prayers were performed, the keys of the Kaaba were handed over to the Messenger of Allah. Bilal al Habishi radiallahu an climbed on top of the Kaaba and began to call for prayer in a loud voice. Mecca listened attentively to this call to prayer.
After the conquest of Mecca by the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him, the Messenger of the Prophet called out this in the streets of Mecca. Whoever in Mecca closes the door of his house and refrains from using weapons, he is given security. At the same time, the Prophet said, the wounded will not be killed, who turns his back and runs away will not be pursued, those who are captured will not be killed. And he also gave amnesty to all the people of Mecca, leaving their lives, property and children untouched. A tent made of leather was pitched for the Prophet peace be upon him at the site of Hajjud near the present day Masjid al Jinn. When the Prophet was asked, Are you not going to enter your house in Mecca? The Prophet said, Did Akil leave us a house? Akil bin Abu Talib was the elder brother of Hazrat Ali, who was 20 years older than him. The Prophet had two houses in Mecca. One, was the house in Ship Ibani Ali, in which he was born, which was inherited from his mother. The other was the house of his wife Khatija, between Safa and Merva, behind the Atar Bazaar. After the migration of the Prophet peace be upon him to Medina, Akil bin Abu Talib seized these two houses and sold them. The Prophet was told, then stay outside your house, in one of the houses of Mecca. The Prophet peace be upon him said, I will not enter the houses, and settled in the tent prepared for him. In the morning, the Prophet left his tent and moved towards the Kaaba with his companions. As the Prophet peace be upon him entered the Kaaba with his army, Abu Sufyan was sitting in front of the Kaaba, thinking, Should I gather troops for Muhammad? Should I go back to fight this man again? What should I do? The Prophet peace be upon him stopped in front of him and said, Then Allah will make you despised and humiliated again. Abu Sufyan looked up and saw the Prophet standing next to him. Until now, I was not convinced that you are indeed a prophet, and I repent to Allah and ask his forgiveness for the delusions I had in my heart. Then, the Prophet peace be upon him gave a sermon to the people at the Kaaba. He invited the non-Muslims to Islam and invited them to make the declaration of allegiance to Islam. All Meccans, men and women, big and small, came to swear allegiance to the Prophet. Many polytheists, including Abu Quhafa, Haris bin Hisham, and the sons of Abu Lahab, became Muslims and swore allegiance to our Prophet. Even Suhail bin Amr, Ikrimah bin Abu Jahil, and Safwan bin Umayyah were given amnesty and invited to Islam, and they too became Muslims. After the conquest of Mecca by the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him, the polytheists of Khawazin, who were in the surrounding areas, began to gather armies, thinking that it was their turn. Taking all their property, women and children with them, the Khawazin came to the place of al autas and tribes from all sides began to come to the aid and gather at al autas When the Sarkif people living in Taif joined the Khawazin, a large army of 14 to 20,000 people was formed. The Prophet peace be upon him heard that the Khawazin and the Sarkif were preparing to fight. He called Abdullah bin Abi Hadrat al-Islami. He ordered him to go to the Khawazin and stay among them and bring news until he could go among the people and get the information about them. Abdullah bin Abi Hadrat went out and went to the Khawazin. He wandered around the camps of the Khawazin. He went as far as Malik bin Af. He found the leaders and the commanders of the Khawazin with him. Malik bin Af said to his companions, Muhammad will never fight again after this time. He has only ever fought and defeated tribes who had no knowledge of warfare 
At dawn, you will line up your animals, women and children behind you. Then you will line up your soldiers. When you meet the Muslims, you will attack. Break the scabbards of your swords. Attack all together as one man. Know well that the first to attack is the one to be defeated. He heard and memorized it. He estimated the number of the gathered army to be around 20,000. Abdullah bin Abi Hadrat stayed among the Khawazin for a day or two and then returned and reported to the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him all that he heard and seen. When the Prophet heard the news of the Khawazin from Abdullah bin Abi Hadrat, he hastened to prepare to meet them. The Prophet appointed At-Tab bin Asid as the governor of Mecca and Muaz bin Jabal as the teacher of Sunnah and Fiqh. Safwan bin Umayyah, who had not yet converted to Islam at that time, lent the Islamic army 100 pieces of armor and 100 swords along with 40,000 dirhams. Naufal bin Harith also lent 3,000 spears to the Islamic army. On Saturday, Shawwal V, the Prophet set out from Mecca to Hunayn with an army of 12,000 men. The Prophet had come with 10,000 Muslims to conquer Mecca. 2,000 of the newly converted Meccans, who had heard of the preparations for war, had joined the Islamic army. Another 80 Quraysh, who had not yet become Muslims, joined the Islamic army for beauty. Abu Sufyan followed behind the army, picking up every fallen shield, sword and spear he came across and carrying them on his camel. Malik bin Nav, the commander-in-chief of the Khawazin armies, had sent some of his men as spies. There were three of them and they would spy on the Prophet peace be upon him and his companions and scatter among the Islamic camp. They would bring news to Malik bin Av about the condition of the Muslims. The spies returned to Malik in a nervous and trembling state. Malik bin Av said to them, Shame on you! What is this state of affairs? The spies said, We saw such men, with white, shining faces and on pied horses that we could not help falling into the state you have seen. We, the people of the earth, cannot fight them. If we were the people of heaven, we would fight them. Their eyes would move hearts. If you listen to us, go back to your people immediately. If those people see what we see, they will be in the same condition as we are in. Malik bin Av said, No, you are a cowardly group in the camp. He arrested them with him so that they would not cause fear and dissension in the army. These words of the spies could not stop Malik bin Av from doing what he wanted to do. At dawn, the Prophet put the Muslims in battle formation. When they landed in the valley of Hunayn, a large vanguard moved forward for reconnaissance. As the vanguard advanced between the two mountains, the Khawazin suddenly came out of their hiding places and began raining arrows on the Islamic army from the right and left. The Khawazin were such sharp marksmen that none of their arrows were wasted. Unable to withstand the sudden and fierce barrage of arrows, the cavalry of the Slaymets broke up and retreated followed by the Meccan cavalry and the others broke up and dispersed in their wake. In the darkness of the morning, the Khawazin people emerged from around the mountains and began to chase the fugitives with all their might which frightened the Islamic army. When Anas bin Malik saw this army, he said that he had never seen such a large army before. Since it was still dark and not clearly visible, the army of Khawazin was coming towards the Muslims like a great black storm.
This Lamigami, which had not yet entered the battle, experienced great fear and began to flee. Our prophet peace be upon him, was standing upright with his sword in his hand, calling out to those who were retreating. Where are you going? O oh people, come towards me. I am the messenger of Allah. O oh Muhajireen, O oh Ansar, I am the servant and messenger of Allah. Show patience and perseverance. But the camels were tangled and the people were running away as far as they could. There was no one left with the Prophet except some of the Muhajireen and Ansar and his family members. Seeing the 100 Mujahideen clustered around the Prophet, the Khawarizan attacked rapidly. The Prophet peace be upon him also attacked the enemy army. His uncle Abbas, who was with the Prophet at the time, started shouting at the top of his lungs. O companions who swore allegiance to the Messenger of Allah under the tree of Samura, where are you? Hearing the voice of Hazrat Abbas, the members of the Ansar and Khazraj tribes stopped running and returned saying, Labbaik, Labbaik, and started to turn back. Catch up, O Muhajireen, O Ansar, come O Muhajireen, come O Ansar, come O horsemen of Allah. Shouts filled the entire battlefield, and those who had fled began to regroup. Muslims from all sides began to rush furiously at the Khawazin. The Prophet was surrounded by the soldiers of the Khawazin. Hazrat Uthman, Hazrat Ali, Abu Dujana and Ayman bin Ubaid were fighting in front of the Prophet. On that day, Hazrat Ali was the fastest, most fierce and violent of those who fought in front of the Prophet. It was at that time that the Prophet peace be upon him asked Allah for help and victory. O oh Allah, send down your help to us. O oh Allah, I ask you to fulfill your promise to me. O oh Allah, surely you do not want them to be victorious over us. When the Prophet stood on his grey mule with his stirrups and saw the Muslims attacking the Khawazin with swords, he said, This is the time when the thunder is on fire. Soon after the Prophet prayed, the people of Khawazin became frightened and began to disperse. The Muslims began to chase them all together. When the Khawazin, who later became Muslims, were asked what had caused them to suddenly retreat on the day of Hunayn, they all unanimously stated that they had heard a violent ringing in their minds like iron grains rattling in an iron ball and that a great fear had come over them. Certainly, Allah helped you in many battlefields and on the day of Hunayn, when your great numbers made you vain, but they availed you nothing and the earth became straight to you, notwithstanding its spaciousness. Then you turned back retreating. Then Allah sent down his tranquility upon his messenger and upon the believers and sent down armies which you did not see and chastised those who disbelieved. And that is the punishment of the unbelievers. The Prophet ordered the Muslims to push through the fleeing enemies. When the Khawazins were defeated, the Sarkafids of Taif also broke down and retreated to the fortress of Taif. Malik bin Af, the commander-in-chief of the Khawazin army, took refuge in the fortress of Taif with the Khawazin. From time to time, the Muslims killed or captured the fleeing Khawazin and Sarkif tribesmen. Since the Khawazin had come to Hunayn with all their possessions, the Islamic army took a lot of beauty. The Prophet forbade the killing of women, children and slaves. 
The Meccan polytheists in the Islamic army were frightened at the first wave and left the battlefield. Thus, they could not benefit from the beauty they wanted. The Prophet, peace be upon him, gathered his army and ordered the siege of the fortress of Taif, where the people of Khawazin and Sarkif had fled and hid. When the polytheists were defeated in the Battle of Hunayn, they began to scatter in all directions. Our Prophet, peace be upon him, ordered the Muslims to follow the fleeing enemies. When the Khawazans were defeated, the Sarkafids of Taif were also defeated and retreated to the fortress of Taif. Malik bin Af, the commander-in-chief of the Khawazan army, took refuge in the fortress of Taif with his people. From time to time, the Muslims captured or killed the fleeing Khawazin and Sarkif tribesmen. Since the Khawazins had come to Hunayn with all their possessions, the Islamic army took a lot of beauty. The number of captive women and children taken from the Khawazin was 6,000. The beauty included 24,000 camels, more than 40,000 cattle and 4,000 okiya of silver. When the Prophet peace be upon him was walking around the battlefield, he saw a woman lying on the ground who had been killed. He was very saddened by this. He sent a message to all the commanders and forbade the killing of women, children and slaves. The Meccan polytheists in the Islamic army were frightened at the first wave and left the battlefield. Thus, they could not see the victory and could not benefit from the beauty they wanted. When they went to Mecca, they frightened the people by saying that the Islamic army had been defeated and that the Prophet might have been killed. The governor of Mecca, Attab bin Asid radiallahu an, was very saddened when he heard the news, but he said the following words to calm the people. If Muhammad peace be upon him is dead, Muhammad's religion is alive. Allah is alive and immortal. It was not yet evening when the news came that the Prophet peace be upon him, with the help of Allah, had defeated the army of the Khawazin and that the Prophet had gone with his army to besiege the fortress of Taif. Having been defeated in the battle of Hunayn, the tribe of the Sakif and some of the Khawazins took refuge in the fortress of Taif, locked the gates and prepared to fight. When the Prophet peace be upon him learned that the tribes of Khawazin and Sakif had closed in on the fortress of Taif, he ordered the siege of the city. Khalid bin al-Walid was given a force of thousand men and sent to Taif as a vanguard. The Messenger of Allah peace be upon him also moved towards Taif at the head of his army. The people of Taif knew that they would be under siege. So, they repaired the castle and stocked it with enough food and drink for a year and plenty of stones to throw from the castle with slingshots. Malik bin Auf, the commander of the army, stayed in this fortress to defend Taif. In the early years of Islam, when the polytheists of Mecca became increasingly harsh in their behavior, the Prophet peace be upon him thought of taking his invitation to a center outside Mecca, taking with him Zaid bin Harisa, who had been murdered in the Battle of Muta, he went to Taif to invite them to Islam and seek refuge under their protection. 
However, the people of Taif, who opposed the Prophet's invitation, mocked him and had him stoned. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that what he experienced in Taif was more severe for him than the day of Uhud. When Khalid bin Walid arrived in Taif and saw that the Sarkafids had taken refuge in the fortress and were waiting in a state of war, he set up his headquarters in a place near the fortress and asked for a meeting with them. But the Sarkafids rejected the offer of a meeting and said, O oh Khalid, no man will come down to you from us, nor will you come to us. Surely, your master has never met people other than us who know how to fight. Khalid bin Walid said, Listen to my words. In Medina and Khaybar, those who had fortresses and forces surrendered to the Messenger of Allah. He sent a single messenger to Fadak. They too submitted to his judgment. I remind you and warn you how the Jews of Quraiza had to submit to the Messenger of Allah after they were besieged for days and their warriors were killed and their children were taken captive. The Messenger of Allah has conquered Mecca and defeated and captured the Khawazin. At Hunayn, you are stuck in the earth only in your castle. Those around you have become Muslims and have been left in peace. The people of Taif replied by saying, we will never leave our religion. Meanwhile, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, reached Taif via Nahb. The siege began after the people of Taif refused to surrender and declared that they would continue to defend and fight until their supplies were exhausted. In the first phase of the siege, the people of Taif began to rain arrows from their castles on the Muslims. The people of Taif were firing long arrows like pikes over the walls, and they were accurate. To protect themselves from these arrows, the Muslim army raised their shields and ran towards the walls. At that time, the people of Taif had brought a magician woman up on top of the castle and wanted to protect the castle against the Muslims by making her expose her modesty and divert the Muslims' gaze. Unable to withstand the intense arrow fire, the Islamic army retreated. The Islamic archers began to fire arrows at those on the walls. One of the arrows of the people of Taif struck Abu Sufyan in the eye. Abu Sufyan came running to the Prophet. He said, O Messenger of Allah, this eye of mine has been lost in the way of Allah. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said to him, If you want, I will pray and Allah will restore your eye. Or do you want him to do it in paradise? Abu Sufyan said, I lost this eye in the way of Allah and asked for the return of his eye in paradise. For 10 to 19 nights, the Sarkafis resisted by throwing arrows and stones at the Muslims from Taif. A catapult was built with the advice and engineering of Salman al-Farisi. From this catapult, stones started to be thrown at the walls of Taif. At the same time, a dead babe made of cowhide was built and brought close to the walls. When arrow shots failed to stop the rampart, the people of Taif threw red hot irons and skewers and succeeded in splitting and burning the dead babe. They forced the Muslims to get out from under the dead babe. Those who were burnt by the red hot skewers were murdered, and some of the survivors were murdered with arrows. Our Prophet, peace be upon him, announced that the slaves who would come out of Taif and take refuge with him would be freed. Thereupon, 20 or 40 slaves secretly came out of the fortress and joined the Muslims. 
In order to force the Sarkafids to surrender, the Prophet peace be upon him ordered that the vineyards of Taif, where they grew rare grapes, should be destroyed, and that everyone should cut five of the trees whose fruit was inedible. This was to weary them into submission. At the time when the vineyards were being cut, a man from the Sarkiv stood on the castle and said, Go shepherds, go Mohammed's flocks, go slaves of Mohammed. Do you think that by destroying our grapevines, we will fall into poverty and hardship? The Prophet peace be upon him prayed by saying, O oh Allah, send him to hell. Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas immediately shot an arrow and stuck it in his throat. The man rolled down from the castle, dead. Then the Sarkif said, Do not spoil and destroy the goods. Either we will keep it, or it will be yours. For the sake of Allah and the right of kinship, do not touch the vineyards. Then the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, I am leaving your vineyard for the sake of Allah and the right of kinship. And he gave up cutting the vines any further. The Muslims asked the Prophet's permission to attack the fortress of Taif altogether. The Prophet said, I do not think we will conquer it. We have not been given permission to conquer it for the time being. Omar radiallahu an said, So you are not allowed to prevail over them? The Prophet peace be upon him said, Yes, permission was not given. Hazrat Umar said, O Prophet of Allah, can you not pray to Allah against the Sarkif? The Prophet peace be upon him said, Allah has not given permission to pray against the Sarkif either. Hazrat Umar radiallahu an said, Then why did we kill people against whom Allah did not allow us to pray? The Prophet peace be upon him said, You should emigrate immediately. Then Hazrat Umar announced the Muslims to prepare to return. When the announcement was made to return, the Muslims started talking and going back and forth to each other, saying, How can we go back without conquering Taif? We will not leave this place until Allah grants us its conquest. By Allah, these are lesser and lesser than what we have encountered so far. We encountered the hordes of the Meccans and the Khawazin, and Allah dispersed them. These are but the fox in its hole. If we continue to beseech them, they will die in their huts. Talks and disagreements multiplied among them. They went to Abu Bakr radiallahu an and talked to him. Abu Bakr radiallahu an said to them, Allah and the Messenger of Allah know this matter better. The command comes to the Messenger of Allah from the sky. They went to Hazrat Umar. Umar radiallahu an refrained from interfering in this matter and said, We saw the incident of Hudaybiyah. At Hudaybiyah, doubt entered me that no one but Allah knew. On that day, I appeared to the Messenger of Allah with words I had never used before, and my household and property were almost destroyed. There was good for us in what he did by Allah. There has never been a better conquest for the people than the peace of Hudaybiyah. More people became Muslims without the use of the sword than those who became Muslims from the day the Messenger of Allah was sent as a prophet until the day the peace was written in Hudaybiyah. There is good in what the Messenger of Allah did. I can never, after that, turn to him and object about anything. This is the work of Allah. He reveals to his prophet whatever he wishes. When they were leaving Taif, the Prophet peace be upon him said to the Muslims, There is no God but Allah. He is one. He has fulfilled his promise, helped his servant, and defeated the gathered tribes single-handedly. Say, we are, by Allah, the repentant, the worshippers and praisers of our Lord. The Muslims said, O Rasul Allah, pray to Allah against the Sarkif. The archers have hurt us. The Prophet said, O oh Allah, show the Sarkif the right path, bring them to us. Before leaving Taif, the Prophet said, Inform Malik that if he becomes a Muslim and comes to me, I will give him back his household and his property, and I will also give him a hundred camels. When Malik bin Af heard about the promises made by the Prophet peace be upon him and what had been done to his people, 
he got on his camel and came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and became a Muslim. The Prophet gave him back his household and property and also gave him a hundred camels. He appointed him governor and commander of the tribes of his people who had become Muslims, namely the tribes of Sumaila, Salima and Fahim. These tribes lived around Taif. Malik bin Auf said, O Messenger of Allah, I will overcome the Saqif for you and raid their livestock until they come to you as Muslims. He took his tribes with him and fought the polytheist tribes, especially the Sarkiv. He made raids on them. He made the Sarkiv unable to go out to their pastures outside the walls of Taif. He raided and captured the livestock that went out and killed the men. Malik bin Af's raids became very difficult and tedious for the Sarkiv. When the siege of Taif failed, the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him prayed, O oh Allah, guide them and bring them to me. The Messenger of Allah peace be upon him then divided the beauty of Hunayn and returned to Mecca and then to Medina. That year, the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him sent Zakah officials to the Muslim lands when the crescent moon of Muharram appeared. The Zakah officers reported that some tribes paid the Zakah while others refused to pay it. If the people who did not pay Zakah were not addressed, the people who did pay zakah might also give up zakah and forget about Allah's command to pay it. So the Prophet peace be upon him sent troops against the tribes who refused to pay zakah. Tribes that did not pay zakah were raided. Battles were fought. After Islam entered Medina, the news about Damascus was on the agenda of the Muslims every day as many of the Nabadians went to Damascus. One day, some people from Damascus told them that Eastern Rome had gathered a large number of soldiers in Damascus. It was heard that the tribes of Leprosy, Lahum and Gassan were going to move with the Roman troops. Indeed, the Muslims had no more frightening enemy than Rome. The reason for this was that the Muslims had seen the Romans with their own eyes as they had often traveled to Rome as merchants and had seen them in numbers and in preparation of weapons and horses. So the Messenger of Allah peace be upon him started to gather a large army in Medina to go to Damascus and fight the Roman Empire. He sent a message to Mecca and other Arab tribes, inviting them to join him. He also ordered those who had the means to help the army, as there was famine and high prices. So those who had means helped those who did not have means a lot. Muslim women even gave their jewelry as gifts to the Mujahideen. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq brought 4,000 dirhams, which was all his wealth, to the Messenger of Allah. Umar radiallahu an brought half of his wealth. Uthman radiallahu an equipped one third of the army. He gave more money than anyone else. In fact, the amount he gave was enough to cover the expenses of the army. The Messenger of Allah peace be upon him prayed for him in a special way and gave him the good news that all his sins that had occurred and would occur were forgiven. The Muslims gathered for the Tabuk expedition were too many to fit in the record book. 
But Abdullah bin Ubay, one of the hypocrites, was trying to discourage the Muslims and cause fear and terror among the people by saying, Muhammad is going to go and fight the Romans in this distressing situation in this hot and distant country and against a power that is too numerous to be resisted. Does Muhammad think that fighting the Romans is a game? However, despite this, all the Muslims who had faith obeyed the order of the Messenger of Allah and prepared themselves. The number of participants in the expedition was around 30,000. 12,000 of them were horsemen. On Thursday of Rajab, the ninth year of the Hijra, the Prophet set out from Medina with the Islamic army. On the way, when the Islamic army stopped, the Prophet's camel Kaswa disappeared. The companions went out to look for it. Zaid ibn al asid one of the hypocrites said, Muhammad says, I am the Prophet. He gives news from the heavens, but strangely, he does not know where his camel is. Then the Prophet said, Someone has said this about me. I have never claimed. I did it this way, I know. By Allah, I do not know anything. I only know what Allah Almighty has revealed. I have never attributed anything to myself. I have always said that I know if he informs me. So now he has informed me where my camel is. The camel is in such a valley, in such and such a place, with its halter attached to the branch of a tree. Go and fetch it. So they immediately went there and found the camel. Then the Islamic army reached a place called Tabuk. This place was halfway between Medina and Damascus. When the Islamic army stopped at Tabuk, its majesty surrounded them. No movement was seen either from the Greek army or from the Arabs loyal to Emperor Heraclius. The news that the Greek army had gathered in Damascus turned out to be false. Heraclius was not in Sham but in Constantinople. Thus, there was no battle. But the fact that the Islamic army came to the border of Sham and challenged the Roman Empire scared everywhere. The ruler of the city of Ayla near Egypt, Yohanna, who was frightened by this, came to him and asked for a covenant and security to pay a jizya of 300 gold coins. The messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, gave him amnesty. The people of the cities of Jabba and Ezra in Sham also came and asked for a pledge of allegiance to pay an annual jizya of 100 gold pieces. The messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, also gave them amnesty. The Messenger of Allah put horsemen under the command of Khalid ibn al-Walid and sent him to Uqaidr, the Christian ruler of the city of Dumat al-Jandal. Upon reaching the city, Khalid ibn al-Walid captured Uqaidr while he was hunting with his men. He captured him and brought him to the Prophet. When Uqaidr accepted to pay jizya, the Messenger of Allah released him on that condition. At that time, it was said that the plague had broken out in Damascus. The Messenger of Allah stayed in Tabuk for about 20 days and then, after consultation with his companions, decided to return to Medina. As a result of this Tabuk expedition, the strength and power of Islam spread properly in Rome and the neighboring Arab countries. The hypocrites who said that going on an expedition against Rome would bring death were utterly disgraced. The majesty of Islam spread everywhere and envoys and representatives from the Arab tribes began to come and convert to Islam one by one. Even the people of Yemen, Bahrain and Najid became Muslims and accepted Islam. Eventually, the people of Taif also sent envoys to Medina and expressed their desire to convert to Islam. There was no tribe or power left in Arabia that could stand against the Muslims. People began to come from far and near in groups from all over the world.
It is about these victories and conquests. When the victory of Allah has come and the conquest, and you see the people entering into the religion of Allah in multitudes, then exalt him with praise of your Lord and ask forgiveness of him. This surah was a sign that the Prophet's death was imminent. Because his standing was based on the wisdom of establishing the religion of Islam, when Islam started to spread in this way, that purpose was fulfilled. The companions understood from the verse, when you see the people entering into the religion of Allah in multitudes, then exalt him with praise of your Lord and ask forgiveness of him. To me, now turn to the other side and get ready for the journey to the hereafter. And they began to weep. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam confirmed them. That's the end of another video. More videos about historic battles will be published soon, so please consider subscribing and pressing the bell button to be informed about them. By liking, commenting and sharing the video, you can support us a lot. Thanks to everyone who watched the video until the end and supported us. We are Historic Battles and look forward to seeing you in the next one.